there are over 500 people who RSVP'd for today. Um, this is so wonderful to have you all here and to to get to celebrate. I just I was just in the um, prep room with with Steve and Tram and and Misha, and I just started getting chills just thinking about um, everything they've been through in the last um, in the last week in the last months leading up to this. Um, they've worked their hearts out um, to to win incredible incredible things, and so we are so so fortunate and so honored to to have all of them here and Cliff is joining as well. Um, so welcome everyone. We're gonna, I'm just gonna dive right in um, because uh, we're, uh, why wait? <laughs> I wanna hear from these organizers. Um, so my name is Billy Wimsett. I'm honored to be the executive director of Movement Voter PAC uh, for the purposes of this call. And we have a great agenda. Um, basically, we're we're going to celebrate. Uh, we have so much to celebrate and we're going to have a uh, real talk on 2024. And then I'm going to do my part really fast so you can hear from our incredible local partners. Um, and, and then we're going to talk about where do we go from here? We are less than one year out from the 2024 election. And uh, we're going to be living in a whole new world uh, for good or bad. Uh, less than a year from now. So uh, so we all have a really big job. You can introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, Want to welcome, uh, you can say your name, where you're from, and um, how you're feeling about the election, something you're really excited about having won, something you're nervous about um, going into 2024. And the chat is open. And we're, um, we're also going to introduce a a uh, pledge that we're uh, that I'll talk about in a minute. That uh, Zoe, if you can put it in the chat, and just want to hugely thank the MVP team, um, everyone who put so much work into this 360 degrees, and um, let's dive in. So, um, and actually, I'm just gonna skim through this really fast. Uh, Julie, uh, Virginia, we won really big. Uh, Ohio, we run really big. Pennsylvania, we won a lot of things, almost everything that we were hoping to win, which uh, Steve can talk about. There were so many wins from the Kentucky governor to so many local incredible elections. And actually, even before this week, there were so many wins that our partners had over the course of this year. So 2023 was not an off year. There were so many huge things that we all worked on together as donors, as uh, organizations on the ground that really did the work. And MVP was just really honored to, to play the role of connector um, and curator to, to help the money get where it needed to go. So let's dive in. Let's, um, yeah, we're celebrating. <laughs> um, we really needed this celebration after, you know, all the, the, the pain of the last uh, period. And, um, and, but now we're going to talk about what we're facing. So I don't really need to tell you this, you know, we have, you know, there's a worst case scenario and an amazing scenario that could all happen a year from now. And we have three jobs over the next year. Job one is to block fascism. And what, you know, fascism is a big word. It's the big F word. It's we're you know somewhere on the 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 spectrum of authoritarianism to fascism. The the scholars you know are debating where we are or you know what our where our trajectory might take us. Um, but what we're facing is something like that we've never faced before in in modern times in this country. It can happen here, and um, the ways that this this country is going are is is terrifying. Um, so we're really using that word. We have three jobs: block fascism, win a trifecta, and um, and build. We have to block, and we have to build um, toward a better future. So this scenario, let's not spend any more time on it. Um, it's very real. We just have to acknowledge that. And most of you saw. Um, these terrifying polls 
that we got from the New York Times on um, the this week. And the bottom line is the tre the the numbers, you know, may not be exactly, um, you know, it's just one poll, but the trends in them are corroborated by many, many other polls, by aggregated polling, by focus groups, and by what we're hearing on the ground from our partners um, that, you know, a lot of our base, especially young people and voters of color, are very concerned, disturbed, upset, demoralized, many, many things um, about the state of the country and um, and are not excited about Biden. Um, and it is a very scary situation. And, you know, assuming it's Biden, but whether it's Biden or, or whoever our candidate is, um, that's going to have to keep us, that's going to separate us and, you know, a Trumpist regime, um, the, the deciding factor is going to be our voters and whether they come out, young people, voters of color, our whole Democratic base. Um, and what's going to make that difference? It's trusted messengers. Trusted messengers are the difference between people voting and not voting, people voting for this vision that we're talking about, or becoming disillusioned? And how do we scale trusted messengers? How do we have millions of trusted messengers? We have millions of trusted messengers because they are with organizations in these communities, in every critical community that we're trying to organize. And that's what MVP does. We fund the local organizers who know their communities, who can transform things. And that is how we secure a blue trifecta which is our second job. And if we do that, because there's so much hopelessness out there, if we do that, um, we can have so many things um, that, that we need to have. Not everything, right? The government is never gonna be all the things we dream of, but, um, but there's, you know, we, we probably have a 10 year trajectory if things go well um, to get this country to a better place, but, if we win a trifecta, which is the thing we have to fight for, you know, in the next year, then, and and we thread the needle just right, we could win voting rights legislation in 2025, which could deal with dark money and redistricting, and we could we could set the terms to have a much fairer playing field going into 2026 and 2027. This is. This is a pivot point in history um, and we have to fight for, this is a scenario we have to fight for. We may or may not get there, but, but there is there is a, at least a North Star that we're going toward with huge turnout. We need huge turnout. Here's our targeting. None of this is surprising. These are the, the big seven presidential battleground states, the Senate states, the house in the long game. And, and then, if we do that, next slide, please. Do we really have to do it over again? Yes, we do. We have to do this all over again. I know we're tired, but we got to get on a, you know, we, we got to do this because this election is going to come down to a couple thousand votes in a couple of places, probably. And we can be the difference makers. Our partners can be the difference makers. Our voters can be the difference makers. And they're depending on us for the fuel to not just run a program, but to run the biggest programs that they can. Um, next I'm slide. I'm getting it to go on my... And yes, and we're halfway there. Like, do you know that song? Oh, we're halfway there. We are halfway there. We are living on a prayer. And why I say that is, you know, 2016 was seven years ago. Seven years from now, we'll be in 2030. And 2016 was a, a huge wake up call for us. And ever since then, we've been kicking butt. We kicked butt in 2017. I know Cliff's on here who Black Voters Matter. They won that Senate seat in Alabama that really started turning the tide. And then Trams, 
Trams on here from Virginia. They won a huge surprise victory in 2017. And then in 2018, we won in the midterms. And in 2020, we just barely eked out a trifecta in Georgia. And in 2022, we thought we we're going to lose it all. We defied the odds. So don't, there's, there's no time for hopelessness. 2024, we're, we have to defy the odds again. And we can do it in 2024. This is a history that we're going to write toward a better future. And seven years from now, along this trajectory, as, as our, our investments in these communities grow and, and our, our base um, grows in this country, we have a chance to have a much better country. That is what we're fighting for. Next slide, please. And um, and not only at the federal level, this is not just about the federal level, it's about building power in the states. And I'm gonna show you, uh, the, so this is, so right now Democrats have 17 trifectas. We saw what happens when you win a trifecta with an organized, motivated base in Michigan, in Minnesota, you win, you win by just a tiny margin. In Minnesota, they won by, one seat with a thousand votes and they were able to pass a hundred percent clean energy legislation a billion dollars for young people um for for pre-k affordable housing voting rights driver's licenses you know they won all the things by having a trifecta so here are, are there are 17 trifectas right now there are 11 more states uh sorry 12 more that we think are are the the obvious next potential trifectas to win over the coming decades. Some of them can happen much sooner than this. By 2023, we think that there can be 28, 29 trifectas in this country, which will represent 70% of the population. That is the North Star. That is the realistic North Star that we are, are investing toward, that we're supporting our organizers to get to. And um, so I just want to leave you with that vision and then um, give you a heads up about the action step. You know, so what do we all need to do? We need to invest big and invest early in local organizing and tell our friends. It's not it's not a it's not mysterious, but it's something that you have to actually slow down and take the time to do is make a plan, you know, not just like, OK, I'm going to write a check. I'm going to, you know, click a button but actually take time to think, talk with your financial advisors, talk with your family, talk with your friends and actually make a plan. You know, this is how much money I need. This is how much money I can give away in 2024 over the next, you know, five or 10 years, make a serious plan and, and give early. Um, so we have a pledge that we are just rolling out on this call to give big, give early and spread the word. And there's an opt-in button to have your name shared publicly. Um, and we, we, we're not even gonna share last names. It'll be like Billy W, first name and last initial, cause we want, you know, to protect everyone's, um, you know, identity and privacy. But we are asking you to pledge to give big, give early. And there's an, an opt-in button to, that says, um, you can engage me to spread the word. So I wanna ask everyone to go on, click this button and make a commitment right now that you're gonna give big, give early, whatever that means to you and raise your hand if you are if you want to be engaged as an ambassador, as someone who can co-host an event. Um, that's, what we're, that's what our ask is. And without further ado, I am going to pass this to my awesome colleague, Hallie Montoya Tanzi, we have an incredible program team at MVP who has a much more, more fun job than, than I do getting to work with our local partners. Um, and Hallie, um, Hallie is gonna facilitate the conversation with our local partners. Passing it to you. Hey everybody, I'm so happy to be here and I'm so grateful to be able to moderate a panel with uh, some organizers, uh, from around the country who did just, you know, have done incredible things over the last decade, but especially this year really um, had some amazing wins that we're going to talk more about. So um, 
I think the first person that I'll ask to introduce yourself and uh, share a bit about uh, what happened this year is Tram Wynn, the co-executive director of New Virginia Majority. Tram, if you can um, just give us sort of, I know we, Billy, like really like zoomed through the slides where it talked about all the amazing stuff you won. So if you could just briefly give us the top line of what happened in Virginia this year, but then I think really focus on what's a story or some context about what happened in your state this cycle that you would love more people to know about sort of beyond the top headlines. And I actually just got word uh, Tram is uh, occupied on a urgent call. So um, let's oh. go back to her. Oh, okay. So sorry about that. Um, Misha, let's go to you. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, thanks, thanks for having Ohio on the call today. Um, and all the support. This has been quite a year in Ohio. Uh, this year started with our General Assembly and um, the, the Republicans that uh, uh, are in super majorities in both chambers, as well as uh, control every uh, branch of government in Ohio, forcing an illegal special election on, um, on the state's first time in a century. So the last time we had a statewide special election was 1923. So not a lot of the same voters. Um, but uh, uh, we had a special election on August 8th where um, the Republicans in our state decided to increase the threshold of what it takes to win a ballot in Ohio. So rather than a simple majority, they wanted to increase the win threshold to 60%. Why did they want that? Because we were coming with an abortion amendment, which, uh, spoiler alert, we won this week, yes. Um, and also uh, because we are working towards redistricting reform in 2024. So the legislature, rather than wanting to have a fair fight, because Republicans in Ohio are always looking to make sure that there's not a fair fight, uh, they thought we're just going to increase the ballot threshold. We're going to do it in the middle of the summer when nobody's paying attention. We're going to purge a bunch more voters so it's harder to participate. And um, so we won that race. We defeated that, uh, that amendment on August 8th by 14 points. Then we turned around on August 9th and started working to codify and enshrine abortion access and reproductive health care in our state constitution, which this week we won by 13 points. Um, in a state that people um, have often thought is lost or read. And the reality is when you give people a reason to participate, they will. And the people in Ohio are not read. They are not as antiquated as we think. We have to give people a reason to vote. Um, and so in addition to enshrining abortion access, we also legalized marijuana. Um, and my favorite clip uh, going around this election um, on a Tuesday night was um, Rick Santorum on Fox News saying that this is the reason you can't put quote unquote sexy issues on the ballot because then people, people vote. And what are we doing? And I was like, wow, just say the quiet part out loud. So that's a summary of what we did this year. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Misha. Um, Misha was just, uh, you know, as the leader of the donor table in Ohio, such a linchpin of the success of all the efforts that happened. Um, both ballot initiatives um, was really marshalling resources from 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 throughout the state as well as as well as throughout the country, and was a huge part of making those wins happen. So thank you so much for your work, Misha. Um, Tram is back. So Tram, um, I'm ready now for you to share a bit of context about what happened in Virginia this week, um, as well as sort of what you'd like people to know um, beyond the headlines about the context and the stories that led up to the wins that you had. Thank you. And sorry about that. I was I was hoping that my call would end before we got here, but I appreciate the flexibility. Um, so I'm so excited about our election results on Tuesday. I was at the um, election watch party and I it felt in some ways even better than when we took the Democratic trifecta in 2019. And I know that sounds crazy, but it did feel better because it was such an F you to Yunkin 
And, you know, all of that talk about him potentially becoming a presidential candidate. He's like the rising star. He's like the silver bullet for the Republican Party. And it was just like, no, no, we are not giving you the Republican trifecta. Virginians actually care a lot more about the issues at stake. And we're going to hold everybody accountable. So it was actually really super exciting. Um, so we held our state Senate and we flipped the House um, to Democratic control. And so now we have a huge opportunity to actually continue to pass legislation that'll you know, protect all of our freedoms and actually advance um, a lot of issues for working families, a lot of our progressive values, and send them onto the governor's desk and dare him, just dare him to veto every bill that gets there. Um, and you know that also sets up a really good political landscape for us going into 2025. Um, so it's it's been a really good week. We're all celebrating. We have one race that's still in potential. Um, it's not called yet. We've, it's like, you know, 100 votes. Um, so we're, we're still seeing if we can add an extra margin. But at the end of the day, we are we are super happy. I think one of the key things that led to it, and this is in, in huge part thanks to Hallie and the folks at Movement Voter Project, I think early on um, in the cycle, we were having very regular and honest conversations with all of our funders in terms of what's going on, what the landscape is, what are some strategic interventions that we thought were really important to make sure that we could actually control um, uh, what would happen in this election cycle. And so one of the early interventions that I think was really important, really critical, and it was a part of these kitchen cabinet calls that we were having with Hallie and, and, and several of our um, donor partners was the need to really have like a communication strategy, right? Um, the Youngkin was capturing the national narrative, much like he did in 2021, where when we couldn't um, get national media to, to pay attention to what we were trying to put out, he was able to control the narrative around critical race theory, around parental rights. And we saw early on in this cycle, he was also capturing all of the national media attention. And so we thought about like what was necessary to make sure that we were getting um, coverage in the national media in the ways that were important for Virginians around what's at stake and to also really motivate folks to pay attention that, you know, this isn't a sleepy race. We really need to to um, to 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 assert ourselves in the narrative around all of that. And it worked right. We abortion was obviously the issue. And as we've seen in other states, but in, in making it an, an issue in the media, not only on the ground, but in the media in the way that we did, we essentially backed them into a corner where they felt like they had an answer and their answer was a 15 week ban, right? They started to pivot towards this 15 week ban that I think backfired. At one point we're like, oh, is this gonna work? Um, but it backfired because a ban is a ban, right? A ban is a ban, a ban is, you know, and all of that. And so we were able to really, uh, to really message on that. And so folks that they thought that they could peel away by saying, oh, well, we're reasonable. We just want 15 weeks, exceptions in this cases of rape and incest. They didn't buy it. Right. They didn't buy that message at all. And then on the other side, too, with their base who wanted to do more, who wanted to outright restrict abortion, period. They were also really angry and pissed off because they didn't they didn't want to settle. They didn't want to compromise at 15 weeks. And so I think all of that really backfired. And so we were able to run the race um, on our terms and really cornered um, Yunkin and the Republicans in, into a into a place where they didn't want to be. I think they would have rather have gone on more of the offense around crime and public safety. Um, they were still ugly about that, but we didn't give them enough oxygen and air and space to do that. And then we put them on the defensive, which I thought was really key also. Um, awesome. That is uh, that is a great lesson. And I feel like abortion uh, and the unpopularity of all the restrictions that these states are trying to put in now post jobs has been um, so motivating to voters across the country, um, including in places in the south where um our next speaker is is coming from um we've got cliff from black voters matter uh who i'd like to ask to introduce himself next um to talk about the work that uh, black voters matter did in kentucky and in other places across the south um in down ballot elections to bring home some really important wins this cycle um thanks tram and we'll come back to you in a minute Hey, Tram. <laughs> Just want to say hi to my friend Tram and to Billy and the team. We love our family at MVP. Uh, what Billy did not mention was that MVP was actually our first um, our donation, the first resources we received back in that 2017 
Alabama race between Doug Jones and Roy Moore came from MVP and we've been rolling together ever since then. So thank you to the MVP team. I am Cliff Albright, co-founder, executive director, Black Voters Matter, still tired from being in Mississippi for the week leading up to that election. I'll talk about that in, in just a second, but just very briefly to talk about Kentucky. Um, you know, I'd be remiss without mentioning, you know, Billy mentioned the MVP strategy of getting resources to local groups. And that's very much the way that we do our work at Black Voters Matter as well. And so I'd be remiss um, if not mentioning, you know, a couple of the groups, uh, the coalitions there in Kentucky that we work with, like um, Kentucky Black, you know, the Black Leadership Advocacy Coalition, um, Kentucky Cave, CA. V.E., uh, Alicia Hurl, uh, Celine, um, just some great organizations. And, and, and the point being that, you know, what happened in Kentucky, what happened in Virginia, what happened in Ohio didn't just happen on one day. It didn't just happen for two weeks, right? It's the result of year-long, ongoing, three, what we call the 365 work, that ongoing organizing, right? And so we have been in partnership with groups um, and, and really in all of those states, you know, I talked, we, we spoke with Tram about Virginia and we targeted a couple of districts there in Virginia, including one of the most critical ones in House District 97. But we were able to do that in partnership with Tram, who's on the ground there, obviously, all the time. We were able to partner with groups in Ohio, in Ohio like the Ohio Unity Coalition, um, to, to target the seven cities in Ohio and Black turnout in those cities. And the same thing in Kentucky, it's our partnerships with those groups that allow us to do what we do. And so we did that, right? We did bus tours. We, we worked with the local partners. But the other thing that we did and that we're sometimes able to do, to Billy's point, when the money comes early enough, when it comes big enough, and when it comes in the right form of the hard money, the political money, the PAC money, um, what we're able to do on our PAC side is to do some of the, you know, some of the high level stuff, some of the air war stuff. We got the ground game and the air game. And so we were able to run a, a, a couple of ads on, on social media, Facebook, IG, that in Kentucky that went right after Daniel Cameron. It actually got a, a, a lot of attention in the state uh, because we, we had a radio ad and a, a Facebook graphic and as well as a Facebook video um, that, you know, made reference to Daniel Cameron's anti-Blackness. And it reminded people about what he did in the Breonna Taylor case. And we referenced him as Uncle Daniel, and which got a lot of attention, including from him, and, and not just from him, but after he posted about it, uh, 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 Tate Reeves in Mississippi posted about it because he was scared because we were running ads in, in Mississippi as well. And with a very so limited bad. with a very limited amount of resources, these ads went viral, um, getting, you know, literally thousands of shares um, and, and engagement that was off the roof. Um, um, likes and laughing because people were laughing at the images. And I say all this to say that when we're able to do that combination of the 365 work, right, the, 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 the ongoing education and awareness raising and the issue organizing, right? Um, and then when we're able to layer it with, you know, the straight uh, um, communications warfare, right? That kind of what, what Tram was. It's a you know, there, there's a there's a comms piece to this that we've got to be prepared to do, and that we, we've got to have funded to be able to do at scale early enough with the timing that we need. And when we're able to do that, that combined with the ongoing on the ground work, the issue conversations, you can't have one without the other. And you can't have either one without sufficient resources. And that's why we're so thankful for our friends at, at MVP for always, you know, raising that call to get the resources to the groups that are on the ground that are doing this work and to get it early, right? Not in the last week or two, but to get it early. Yeah. I can say much more about Mississippi, but I'm gonna pass it back um, so that we can hear from, from another great state. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for your work, Cliff. And yes, absolutely second the uplifting of Kentucky Black and Cave, who did amazing work this cycle in Kentucky, um, who we, we're supporters of as well. Um, and so um, the, we're going to have one more organizer introduce himself and talk about what happened in Pennsylvania, where we had like seemingly endless amounts of wins at different levels on Tuesday. Um, and then we'll 
have the sort of open up the panel and have um, folks respond to some more questions after that. But um, first, Steve, the leader of One Pennsylvania, a real voter mobilization organizing advocacy powerhouse in Pennsylvania. Tell us about what happened in your state. Hey, y'all. Uh, um, my name, appreciate that. Thanks for the intro and appreciate being here. I uh, want to just piggyback on what Cliff said. I think MVP this year really supported us and last year. Um, and that allowed for critical work to happen, even despite what folks called an off year. Uh, but I know folks in this room know better, right? Uh, so I really want to just say thank you for the support y'all continue to give our organization. Yeah, I mean, we did the thing. Uh, <laughs> I think we, the results were amazing. And, you know, at the end of the day, we were able to protect abortion rights here in the state. We were able to protect voting rights. I, I say in, in the election, our, the integrity of our election, especially when you think about who was on a ballot uh, for our state Supreme Court. Um, we beat an election denier, someone who literally wanted to give Trump the 2020 elections, despite not winning Pennsylvania. Um, came at her hard we all, from the doors to the phone. We, we did rallies, um, I think two or three rallies, telling folks in our community about this election denier. Um, running for the state Supreme Court race. And so, you know, I think the results were amazing. We also put uh, Sarah Amarato on the county executive office, which is like, you know, in Pennsylvania, you think about the Philadelphia mayor, um, you think about the governor, and you think about the county executive in Allegheny County as one of the, as the three most powerful seats in the state. And now you have a, a true progressive Sarah Amarato, who's going to be leading the county executive office. That is hugely important work for our people. When we think about, you know, one PA, we don't just do electoral work, right? Like we do housing and environmental justice work as well. And so having her in the seat, not only just made history, but it's gonna allow us to do some amazing work in the Western side of the state um, over the next couple of years and talk and show our folks like what's possible when they actually show up to the polls, which is critically important for us. Um, we also made history. We you know, we didn't just kick out a fascist uh, at the state Supreme Court, but we kicked out of Republicans out of Philadelphia's city council. Like, pretty much, yeah, I can't even, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, for folks that don't know, in Philly, there are 10 council people, five, seven of doors are, 17 council people, seven of doors are at large. Of the seven, two are usually held for a minority party. Forever, it's been Republicans. And in 2019, we took one of those seats and on Tuesday, we took the second seat. And so you have two black working class folks um, who are now our independent council people from the Working Families Party. And that, you know, to me, that is a result of a, almost a decade of organizing. And, you know, since 2016, telling people in Philadelphia, there's no reason that the, the Republicans no longer deserve governing power in this city. And you saw that come to fruition last night um, on Tuesday. Those are huge victories because, you know, Philadelphia is going through a housing crisis. They're trying to take Chinatown, basically. Uh, big developers are trying to basically get rid of our Chinatown. City Council plays an incredible role. Um, and I'll just end by yet again, uh, Black voters and young people showed up in the state and they were clearly, they clearly understood what we were against. We were against fascism. Our, our rights to abortion was at stake. Our democracy was at stake. And they showed up and they said no. And that work, like Cliff said, took all year of having conversation. We at 1PA try to have six conversations with our folks and the number of conversations depend on how much funding we have, right? And so just wanna again say thank you for the opportunity and, and the resources that we got this year to be able to do this work all year round. Amazing, thank you so much. I The Philly, I mean, all of those wins are great but the Philly City Council race wins just seem like, yeah, such a such a great like strategic move and opportunity that you all captured there um, that will um, really help people. Um, and so I I loved the way you were highlighting Steve's you know at least teasing some of the policy stakes of these fights. Obviously, the reason that we at MVP and um, all of you on this call are invested in. Um, you know, changing elected leadership in our in these states is not because we just love Democrats. Um, that's like, I don't think that's where anyone's coming from. Uh, it's because the policy stakes um, are huge in these races. And, um, and I wonder if, um, 
any of you would uh, be willing to share some of the like policy opportunities you see. Um, and, you know, in your case, Misha, obviously the policy opportunities that are opened up in, in by August doesn't have to be elected leadership, right? It can be these ballot initiatives as well um, are huge. So um, would just love to hear what you're excited about um, in terms of potential policy change uh, coming up after this. Um, I'm happy to jump in. Uh, so, um, while our uh, policy to enshrine abortion access uh, will be added to the Constitution now, which is great, um, so it's the policy change that we wanted. What it also means um, is that the, the biggest obstacle we've been working for the last five years to overcome in Ohio is voter suppression, which somebody mentioned in the chat. Um, that their son was experiencing in the university. Uh, Ohio has some of the most restrictive voting laws. Um, the state has purged 2.5 million voters. Um, that is more humans than elect the governor here. Uh, shocker, they're mostly black, brown, and young people. Um, our state has uh, the most restrictive uh, um, access to voter registration. So we have all these hurdles to overcome. And because of that, Ohio has one of the lowest participation rates in the Midwest. So average participation for a state of 12 million people in an off-year election, I hate that word, but that's, you know, for us where we are in uh, 2023. So average participation is between 700,000 and 1 million voters. That's it. And this year in the special election, again, have not had a special election in a century, we had 3 million people vote on August 8th. Then in November, we had 3.9 million people vote. And so that is building as we are increasing turnout um, and, and expanding the electorate. Then imagine what we can do in 24 as we're working to elect uh, re-elect Sherrod Brown we also want to put more ballot measures in this direct democracy that voters get to like actually, they don't have to rely on electing a person to represent them. They get to vote for something that they want. So we are going to reform redistricting and add um, voting rights to the ballot measures to make sure that people do have access to vote. Amazing. Um, I'll add some some stuff. I, I said earlier that, you know, I'm excited about the opportunity to just get a bunch of legislation passed and dare the governor to veto every single thing that gets across his desk. He, he might. Um, he might not. Who knows? But we're going to we're going to do it anyway. Right. Um, so I'm excited about things that have been on our priority list for so long that we didn't get to finish um, in 2021. We we passed hundreds of really great bills when Democrats took, took the trifecta in 19. So in 20 and 21 um, alone, I think 300, over 300 of our uh, policy priorities got through, but we weren't done. So I'm excited to be able to roll up our sleeves and get back to work and passing things like paid family and sick leave, um, uh, paying, uh, getting cover all kids through, which would give all children in Virginia, including undocumented um, kids, access to affordable health care um, and health insurance. We need to continue our progress on raising the minimum wage, which was really important, even though we passed a minimum wage in 2020 to get up, up to 15 it actually required a reauthorization um, next year. And so that was one of the big things on the line. Otherwise it would have stayed stagnant at $12, which is what it is now. Um, expanding voting access, which M Misha talked about. I Virginia went from 49th in the country for access to voting to now we're at number 11 because of the things we did in 2020 and 2021. I am aiming for number one. <laughs> like I wanna be in that top spot for voting access. And so uh, we're gonna do some things there. I'm just really, really excited that we can just actually put forward an agenda that works for all of us, right? A people's agenda, a working family's agenda that actually puts real people at the heart of it and show folks that we are fighting for something, right? And I think that's going to be really important as we go into the 2024 cycle and beyond. Like people are hurting, right? The world seems on fire and they really want leadership um, and a vision, right, from our leaders that actually is going to address the, the pain that they are experiencing on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. And I'm just excited that we're going to be able to do some of that and show that there are folks 
that are looking out for them. There are folks that we can help get elected that will, you know, put it all out there and fight tooth and nail to pass these things. And that, you know, we can work together and we might not get it done, but at least people will know that they have champions and that if we continue to stay engaged and we continue to work with folks that are going to champion our issues, then we can get it done. Like we have to give folks that, that, that sense of hope. Right. Um, and I think that's what I'm really looking forward to from a policy agenda perspective. Awesome. Um, okay. I'll, I'll throw another one out there unless did you see where you're trying to get in there? Yeah, I just, I, I think really quickly, I think the results last night have done th three things for us, right? Like we are, the state Supreme Court, given that it's 5-2 Democrat, I think like really the reality is we've, we've essentially protected 2024. If any shenanigans happens, we know the state Supreme Court is going to do the right thing. Um, the second thing I will say is like with Sarah Amarado in Allegheny County's executive seat, given so much IRA money, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the summer reserve and the, the ARP money, stimulus funding, we really see this as an opportunity to like really leverage this seat to like really spend in our communities and like really have robust vision and programs and resources brought into our communities through that seat. And we want to work on a collaborative effort with Sarah because she needs, right, her being successful shows people what's possible when the right person's in office, right? And so I think that's, that's going to be amazing. I think last thing I will say is like in, in 2016, when Tr Trump w got elected and we saw a Muslim ban, we were able to shut down the airports in Philly, right? When we saw all the shenanigans that they, he was pulling across the border, it was local elected officials like council member Helen Gim at the time who showed up and organized from the halls of power. And, you know, unfortunately she's not in council, but like given that Nick and Kendra are now local leaders are got elected last night, I'm super hopeful that they're going to be able to continue that basically the thing we were doing for the last couple of years, which is show how local leadership can fight against and protect our folks against even fascists at the federal level, right? And so that's super critical and I'm super excited about that opportunity. Awesome. Um, so, okay, I just, I think that we have time for one more. I, I actually had like a bunch more questions I wanted to ask you all. And there's so much that I'd love to talk with you about. Um, so anyway, I'm sorry, our time is not longer, but for now I'll ask you, uh, Billy highlighted in his slides earlier um, the recent New York Times Siena poll that came out showing Biden behind in some critical swing states. And I know the presidential election is on everyone's minds um, coming up um, and in the work. And so one of the takeaways that I saw highlighted in the news media from that poll was Biden's declining margins among young voters and voters of color. Now, we all know, you know, his margins among older white voters continue to be way worse. Um, but I'm wondering in your work with young voters and your work with voters of colors on the ground, if of color on the ground, if that is a dynamic that you're seeing and how you're imagining, um, you'll want to address it in your work next year. Um, I will just say polls are not reality. Just start there. Um, I think one of the best examples that I have for, even from this cycle, right, is, um, young people turned out in, in droves this year that we were not expecting. In part, thankfully, for the work of some of our partners like NextGen, who did a lot of work on campus when, and think, I'm so thankful they came back to Virginia this year. But just to give like just some context to that, um, we had more same day voter registrations on Tuesday. We had 13,000 same day voter registrations on Tuesday across the state. The vast majority of those were on college campuses. At the, uh, at the campus of William & Mary in Williamsburg, there was a three and a half hour line on Tuesday because students were lining up to do a same day voter reg registration to cast their ballot. And I will tell you, it was not because they were motivated by the candidate that was on that ballot. It was one of the top swing state Senate seats that we had. Unfortunately, we lost it. It was Senate District 24, Monty Mason, incumbent Democrat, who was who's moderate, you know, a lot of progressive organizations actually did not endorse him because he wasn't super aligned with everything. But those young folks turned out to vote, not because of him, but because of what was at stake, right? What was at stake and the things that they deeply cared about, whether it was climate change, whether it was protecting their freedoms. I mean, all that's what motivated them to go out to vote. And so I think that's what we need to think about, right? Is how do we tap into this energy that we know young folks have, that voters of color have, and engage with them and speak to them in ways that matter to them. And it's not about the candidate, right? This isn't going to be about Joe Biden. It wasn't about Monty Mason. It's not about these candidates that, you know, we want to prop up as our heroes because they're not. 
And so I think like that's what we have to keep in mind and, and realize and recognize that folks around us are really paying attention and, and folks are fighting for their lives and their livelihoods. That's that's what's motivating to to to, to voters. And so these head to head polls and like, will you vote for this person? Will you vote for that person? I don't pay any attention to that. It's really like there are more things that are that are at um, that are on the line. And I think people know that. Um. Thank you, Tram. Anyone else want to get in there on that one? Otherwise, I'm going to pass it back to Billy. I can just pick up plus one what Tram did, but I will pick it back about like a solution for us. Like, I think given that, like, really the candidate don't matter, I think Black folks have always said, like, you know, it's like the lesser of two evil always for us in election time. So really, like, thinking about beyond the candidate. And for us, it's about just, like, talking about what's at stake in this election. So, like, voting rights, abortion rights. Um, your community having clean water, clean energy, and, and naming the bad guys. I mean, in this state, we started talking about billionaires, mega billionaires who are funding mega candidates across the country, also now getting into Philadelphia primaries, right? Like showing who the bad guys are and showing what's talking about what's at stake to me is more effective at the door than saying, "Will you vote for this person because X?" Right? Because uh, oftentimes the reality is when we're talking to someone, they're like, "I haven't seen that person in my community. I haven't had someone knock on my door. You're the first person to knock on my door. This is probably the second time you knock on my door." So having those real conversations about what I say, what's at stake, is more important. Last thing I'll say is like, you know, for us, like doing the organizing and connecting that to the electoral po election um, politics is also what we think is like, that work, right? Like if I'm talking to you, ten five times during the year, I'm like, let's talk about education. Let's show up to city council. Let's hold these folks accountable. Or, or like, there's a water crisis. How can we help? Like, there's a housing crisis. Let's fight together. And then when I show up to, to your door and say, yo, this is what's at stake, all of the things we've been talking about. And so you need to show up. That is absolutely mo motivating than being like, vote for Biden just because, right? And so to me, I think that's like the, the solution. Absolutely. Um, okay, Cliff, you got the last word. Uh oh, um, no, I mean, I, I agree with what Tram and Steve were saying for the 90 to 95 percent. Right. One, first and foremost, like Tram said, I don't I, I don't pay attention to any poll that's a year out. That's ridiculous. <laughs> right. Um, I, I definitely don't pay attention to most of these polls, especially when they're talking about um, voters of color uh, and young younger voters and, and black voters. Again, from from my experience in particular, we were told Trump was going to get 20 percent of the black vote. He didn't. We were told here in Georgia that Herschel Walker was going to get 20% of the Black vote. He didn't. We were told Daniel Cameron was going to get 20% of the Black vote. He definitely didn't, right? And so, you know, I just take all these polls with great assault. And for all the reasons that Tram and Steve were talking about, it's really about the issues. If I had on one of our Black Voters Matter hoodies, most people know it says Black Voters Matter on the front, but on the back side, it says it's about us. Because everything that Steve was just talking about, everything Trey was just talking about, we focus on the issues and less on the candidates. And that tends to get people to come out even when they don't know that candidate. So that's why I'm saying I agree 95%. But I will say this, um, that poll doesn't need to create any kind of sky is falling, right? But we do need to recognize that it, it might be drizzling a little, right? Um, it's, with, with Biden, it's not just People don't know him, right? Or they're not sure what he did. That's part of it. But you've also got a segment of our community that is like, especially over the past three weeks, that is like, I can't vote for somebody that supports genocide, right? And whether we whether we all agree or disagree, and there's lots of history and different opinions, but the reality is that at least amongst younger voters of color, in particular younger Black voters, they see more of not so much the history of, you know, Black Jewish alliances and the civil rights movement. What they see is is a, a group of Palestinians that look like them, that are in a colonial apartheid situation that they're very familiar with, and they and they see that, and then they see Biden's response. So you've got a lot of younger voters of color, again, particularly Black, that it's not just about oh, you know, I'm not enthused about him. It's really about, I will never vote for him. And that's a real thing that we are going to have to confront. And there's some other issues that, again, younger Black voters are, like, again, not just ambivalent on, but are upset about. So we're going to have to have a lot of honest conversations. And some of it's going to have to start with acknowledging 
those frustrations and those feelings and these policy different like we can't we can't pretend that that doesn't exist but then we have to be in dialogue to try to move past and try to see and i don't want to say move past because that makes it sound like you just but we have to be in dialogue to say okay this is the stuff we don't like this is the stuff that we do like this is what the other people are talking about who have an entire agenda that's based on anti-blackness and anti-young people and anti-women it's going to be hard for some people it's, it's you know so some of some of that polling again just throw it out it's trash but there's there's some something beneath the surface that i think we as organizers have to pay attention to i think the candidates and the party have to pay attention to they've got to have better policies and better conversations with our communities um thank you for that cliff um i'm now going to pass it actually directly to jackie Kaplan Perkins from our donor team who is going to start to wrap us up. Thanks yeah. so much to I, all the panelists for all your work. And actually, if I can just just jump in and, and just thank the panelists again, like you all are phenomenal, you know, and just kind of speaking to to what what Cliff's saying, like, I think this is the biggest crisis we've had in in on the left and the center left in this country, you know, and and our job is to, you know, to keep doing this work and to hold our family together through this crisis. Um, and um, yeah, and I'll pass it to Jackie, but just want to appreciate Cliff for for speaking about, you know, what what the real situation is. Um, it's it's going to be incredibly hard, and you know, we are all called that this is a leadership moment for all of us to hold each other through this and and to um yeah so just wanted to to say that and thank you so much Hallie and passing it to you Jackie well hello um I uh my name is Jackie Kaplan Perkins I am a uh, regional philanthropic director with MVP and I am from the great uh, city of Chicago um but sitting here um, we're getting very excited for the Women's Donor Network Conference to start. Um, Tracy Gary, I see that you're on this call. We certainly miss you here in in North Carolina. Um, and you know, Cliff, I, I and and the whole panel, I really want to thank everybody. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot. Well, one the biggest thing I'm thinking about a lot is what else Rick Santorum would uh, decide are sexy topics, right? And I think that we should make sure we we put those in all of our, our calls um, if abortion is a sexy topic. But um, but certainly there, we also need to have difficult conversations. And I think um, one of the things that has always been um, amazing to me about MVP is the community because and uh, both the community of, of supporters and partner organizations and the communities that we all build. And so um, we are um, from the beginning, I've said we are about uh, communities, not candidates. We want to build uh, the powers of communities and um, we want to individual communities as well as see us as a collective community. Um, I come from Chicago, as I said, we are known as a city of neighborhoods. Um, and um, you could walk into different neighborhoods in Chicago and you actually think you're in, in different countries. Um, but we come together uh, as a city with a lot of pride. And I think uh, that's how we're feeling about, um, I'm hoping that's how we're all feeling about MVP right now. Um, you know, I think this, the, one of the other things I think is really amazing, and I'm feeling the energy from the panel, is that we planned this call to happen before we knew what would happen on Tuesday. And so we are all um, should take a moment and take uh, a victory lap and be really proud of what we've done. But I think it's important to know that our groups would have done that, um, done that same amount of work. Um, and um, and sometimes they don't always have the outcomes they want, but we are building um, incredible momentum, and we're 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 building that with all of you. Um, I had the good fortune of getting to see Tram speak uh, a few months ago, and I can tell you um, uh, the energy in her voice and the excitement is uh, is is wonderful to see. So thanks, uh, thank you to all four of you, um, and Hallie. Um, I want to, uh, one of the things Steve said is, you know, we did a thing in Philadelphia and uh, uh, in Pennsylvania and um, 
And, you know, it, at MVP, we're trying to do a, a thing too. Um, and we're trying to keep these things going because this isn't um, just about uh, blocking fascism, which is our first and foremost thing, but this is also about hope and possibilities. I am feeling hopeful uh, for the first time in a long time. And certainly in the last three weeks, I am seeing um, what happens when when communities come together and we work together for a common goal. And so um, I'm hoping that you all are feeling that level of enthusiasm too. Um, and we, we, you know, we have people on this call from 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 coast to coast, and uh, I want to say, and people who've given for years. I see John Steiner and Margot King, who've been some of our longest time supporters. I know there are some people here, a number of you who uh, who signed up just yesterday after the wins to see what this is all about. So, um, for those of you who have given this year, uh, thank you. Um, for those of you who've not given this year, um, we are going to ask you, as you expect, um, um, to give big, um, to give and give big. Uh, many people give in the final quarter of the year um, and often in the final month. Um, but as you just heard, if if you're people who give at the at the last part of the year, you missed the wonderful opportunity to invest in the wins you just heard about. But fear not, um, 2024 is upon us. So what we are asking everybody to do tonight, and um, I have a I have a having lived with a child who has ADD, I know that I have to say things in order for him to do what he wants to do. So I am saying you need to do. We're asking you to do these things and do do it in this order. Um, if you have, if you have a given already, consider giving again. And if you haven't given, um, please consider giving and giving big. And by big, I mean something that, um, something that will, I like to say that it is your checkbook, not your Facebook, that really uh, expresses your values. Um, and so um, no matter how much we're posting about what's going on in the world, if we can give, um, we should. And so uh, give big before the end of the year, give early. And the giving early is, uh, we're asking for a twofold thing. We're asking you to give early next year so that no matter what time of year you usually do your giving, um, we're going to ask you to give early. And I know there's another slide on that. And then the third thing we're asking you to do is to, uh, is to spread the word to your friends. You can move the slide now. Um, and I think you've heard this already. I know we're getting short on time that, you know, every dollar you move today yields more votes closer to election day. Uh, most people on this call have done door knocking. And especially when you door knock on election day and you feel that amazing piece of what it would have been like to get out just one more vote. Um, this is what our groups are doing every day and building their communities. So um, any every day we wait um, we, you know, we lose, we potentially lose some votes. So um, we're hoping that you all will give today. I believe Zoe is dropping lots of things um, in the, in the chat right now about how to do that. Next slide. So um, I think you heard uh, from, I think you heard from Cliff as well that, you know, none of this is happening um, people who give and start to pay attention in September are not really helping the groups on the ground. Um, groups are needing to staff up and scale up. And they're not only doing it for one day, they're doing it for um, many days and many years. Um, some of the victories we heard about um, you know, Black Voters Matter started in 2016 and, and we're eight years, you know, seven years later. So um, we, they're going to Um, now. And so we really want to be, we MVP really want to be able to give them what they need as early in the year as possible. Uh, next slide. So what we're asking everybody to consider doing is to give 50%, think about how much the maximum you could give in a cycle of 2024 and consider giving half of that um, in the next um, two months, if you haven't already given. And then we're asking people, we would love if people could give another half by March of 2024, but we know that's not possible for everybody. So no matter what time you give, we're asking for 50 by the end of this year, 
uh, 25 percent by March of 2024 and 25 percent by July, when we know that that's really the last people um, that our groups uh, can, you know, wait for some of this as they're gearing up for September. Um, so um, with that, I see we're right at the hour. So I really want to thank you all. Um, please join movement.vote uh, pledge. Uh, please give. And um, we look forward to continuing to partner with all of you. Thank you, Jackie. And thank you so much, Misha, Cliff, Steve, Tram, and Hallie. Um, I hope that uh, people are walking away with this sense of hope of what we did together um, uh, in supporting these incredible groups this week. And let's multiply that. Let's go out there and, and hold each other through thick and thin to get to the better world that, that we need to, to get to together. And um, go team. <laughs>